Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, side event. I'm Martin Kretschmer. I'm Professor of Intellectual Property Law at the University of Glasgow and Director of the Quaid Centre. And I will introduce the team in a moment. It's a team effort, what you will see. And it's a little bit immodest. Um, as you will see, we claim uh, that we create a database uh, which represents the complete empirical knowledge um, about copyright law and its, and its effects. This, I would say this is an ambition at, at this moment, but we have more than 850 empirical studies catalogued and classified and available for analysis. And I think it's a big step forward. But it's a beginning, it's not an end point. So um, before we show you a little bit about how this database works and the use of it for US policymakers, I would like to give a bit of context how we came about starting this project. So the Create Center, the UK Copyright and Creative Economy Center, was uh, established in 2012 by the UK Research Councils, three different research councils, different disciplines, arts and humanities, social and economic sciences, but also engineering and physical sciences. And there was a perceived need that we have to change the evidence base for copyright policy. Um, copyright had become too important for society to leave it in an in a evidence-free policy space. So the UK Research Council launched a competition and the University of Glasgow uh, uh, won the competition and since 2012 we tried to build the evidence base for copyright law with new research projects but also with the consolidation of what we know already. So that's where we come in here. So, in 2014, then, Chris Erickson and I and an economist, uh, Theo Kutmaridis, started to develop this approach to, to a wiki database we will show you now. So I will demonstrate a little bit um, how this works. So that's the, um, the copyright portal. It has three components. So one is the underlying database, the catalog of, of, of 850 studies. The second aspect is the visualization tool where you can de detect patterns and also gaps in the evidence and then the use cases, um, how you can make use of what we produced for your purposes. Let's have a quick look at the underpinning database. So basically in alphabetical order you will see 800 studies and many empirical studies you will have never seen before. And I think that's an important uh, primer for, for many of us. There, there's much more work out there than you ever thought about. But also the work started fairly recently. So I'm moving over to the visualization tool, identifying patterns. You can see that before 2000, there was actually hardly any work at all. So, so you could say when the, you know, let's say the WIPO Internet Treaties in, in, in 1996, they were essentially negotiated in an evidence-free zone. So there, there, there was no empirical work relating to copyright law at that time. And it took off in, in many ways in response to that challenge. It was the moral panic about Napster, about digital downloading, um, the big debate in, between econo economists, you know, whether that is, uh, downloading peer-to-peer -peer is, is a substitute or not. So suddenly there was a kind of a, a narrow interest in one field of economics to, to do work. And it took off um, quite, quite rapidly from about 2000. Um, but we also see immediately that there are um, kind of strange patterns which can be explained in part by what I just told you. So if you look, for example, by geolocation, the studies are dominated by, by the USA. And if you look by industry and policy issues, the studies are dominated by the music industry and by enforcement issues. Okay, but you know, copyright law is not really only about the music industry. And if you look down the set of sectors, you find video game publishing with a few studies further down, but video games is a much bigger industry than the music industry. So you can immediately see that the patterns of empirical evidence is dramatically skewed. And I think that's an important thing to, to take away from, from, from this session. I think it's now time to introduce the team. So Professor Chris Erickson, um, 
he's a communication sociologist, and as I say, we work together closely um, in, in setting up uh, the, this evidence project. Um, then we've got Bartolomeo Meletti, who's the creative director for, for, for Create and was the mastermind behind the visualization tool you see here. And we've got Andy Wallace, who was a PhD student at the Create Center in the first generation of PhD students, and she was a coder of the first generation. So, so, so a lot of what the, the data you, you see here came out of a cohort uh, of which uh, uh, Andrea was a, a leading part, and she's now associate professor at the University of Exeter in, in law and technology. So the way we will run now the session is Chris Erickson will say a little bit about um, the, the conceptual choices we made when we were setting up the, the wiki database. And then we will demonstrate a few examples how you can gain insights from, from, from the material which is there. So this is more or less the summary what I've given you at the moment. Summarizes some of the points I just made. And now I hand over to Chris Erickson. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So thank you so much for coming and spending time with us. And um, what I'm going to talk about are um, some of the challenges of working in this open knowledge approach um, and the benefits. So one of the goals and ambitions with the Copyright Evidence Wiki project is that we aim to be an objective, impartial, um, you know, external source for evidence in a policy field which is hotly contested. And the open knowledge approach of using the uh, media wiki software and design um, helps us to achieve some of those aims. So uh, in independence, I think, in the evidence policy making sphere requires openness about methods, um, findings, and interpretations. And the media wiki platform helps us to do that through, um, for example, its user-led orientation, uh, the ability of anyone to edit a Wikipedia um, in some ways is translated over to our project where we allow anybody to propose a study to be included uh, in the project. It's also interoperable with other open knowledge projects like Wikipedia. Um, and it's verifiable because it has history pages and talk pages where we can see how decisions were made about um, any given entry. Another advantage of the MediaWiki platform is that it allows comparison and sorting uh, and organization of um, the corpus uh, because it's a structured data set um, that allows us to compare the studies on various different variables. But as I'll show in a second, we had to decide what those categories were um, a priori. We've also tried to maintain like external sources of validation. So we have a, um, uh, an editorial board. We have um, drawn input from a variety of external stakeholders, including through hackathons and engagement with the open knowledge community around things like how to improve and further develop the platform for users. And we use open and um, you know, sort of standardized metrics. So we use, for example, the DCMS UK uh, definition for creative industries in order to sort of construct those fields for, for sector. We also use JEL codes, which are economics um, codes for discipline to organize papers. When we started out, and we didn't know anything at all. <laughs> we had to figure out, well, what would be on a wiki page for a given um, piece of evidence about copyright? We had to make some decisions. So the first decision was kind of what counts as a study for inclusion in the copyright evidence wiki. And there, what we're really focused on ultimately are empirical studies, which can include both quantitative or qualitative uh, methods of data collection and analysis. And that can include uh, government reports and gray literature. It's not forcibly uh, peer-reviewed articles, although that is the bulk of what's currently in, in the wiki. And then we made the decision of sort of, well, what, what is the primary way that we're going to organize and compare papers? And uh, of course, methods um, are, are one of the most important ones. So in the wiki, we, we uh, distinguish between methods of data collection and methods of analysis. So you can compare articles on both of those metrics. Um, so you can sort of really see what the underlying data were that the authors used to um, reach their claims. Um, and this is a, a visualization of um, the whole corpus. We see that. There are, in general, about equal measure of quantitative uh, collection and quantitative analysis, and that they dwarf the qualitative papers. But there are a, a, a fair number of those. And some of the sort of main ways that researchers have investigated copyright's effects are through things like uh, surveys and, on the qualitative side, uh, content analysis. In terms of anal analyzing data, we see a lot of regression analysis and um, more uh, analysis of variance. So 
we had to essentially determine um, the scope of different variables that would be used to sort papers as they were uh, brought into the corpus. And um, as I said, we uh, had to decide sort of what were the main categories of research methods. There are a zillion research methods in the world, um, but we've done our best to kind of uh, uh, exhaustively source the main ones and be able to um, categorize papers according to those. And here are some, so you can see we've got experimental laboratory, experimental field, experimental natural. So we, deter we distinguish between different types of experimental research when it comes to um, uh, quantitative methods, and on uh, qualitative, um, you know, survey research, case study, ethnography, life history, unstructured interview, there are many different um, qualitative methods that we can uh, dig deeper into. And uh, the number beside each one are the number of studies which correspond to that method currently in the corpus. The main purpose was to make this uh, useful for you right, for, for users to be able to compare and look at the sort of overall evidence field in copyright around particular criteria. So we collect information about, for example, what was the country under study, what were the units of analysis, what was the time period that the data were collected, um, and such like, so that you can uh, quickly make those comparisons. I'd like to show you just a quick example of how you could use the um, Copyright Evidence Wiki now to start generating a literature review and gain some ideas about a particular topic in, in copyright. So I'm gonna use the example of um, DRM, or Technical Protection Measures, which is something I'm currently working on. So I approached the wiki and thought, well, can I build a lit review on some of these questions? Is our DRMs uh, or TPMs effective? What are the welfare effects of um, DRM? Um, how do th cultural heritage uh, and educational users experience DRM? So, if we go onto the wiki, if we go here and we search at the very top, there's a search bar, just type in DRM. We find there's uh, currently 24 empirical studies um, in the wiki dealing with digital rights management, either in the title or the abstract, which are indexed in our, in our wiki. So I went through and over the course of you know a, a day, was able to go in through and, and read each of these studies and start developing some overview findings of this topic. And what I was able to find is that there are some main research themes when it comes to uh, the current empirical research on digital rights management. A major theme is, of course, the balance between protection and access to works um, and how that maybe interferes with user experience, user exceptions. On the welfare question, on the question of effectiveness, there are a good number of studies which ask uh, whether or not DRM is an optimal strategy for uh, content producers and rights holders. And then there are differing views on that, but the majority of findings uh, seem to suggest that overabundance of DRM or overly strict DRM reduces value, reduces utility for users. And some alternative proposals, which are, for example, that DRM might actually reduce uh, searchability of content, making it harder to find for users in the long tail, as Zhang studied, um, or that DRM could work as a kind of a sociological reinforcement of morals um, and steer people away from piracy, as discussed by Yoon. So I um, was able to you know, find some of the lines of debate in this, in this field fairly swiftly through the wiki. So I thought that was really, really um, uh, useful. And just to finish off, in terms of the industries that were covered by those 24 empirical studies, we find, as Martin pointed out, a real abundance of studies on music, uh, as well as studies uh, just generally on optical discs, including uh, you know, DVDs and, and music CDs, e-books, and some that just consider the totality of you know, cultural works. But this suggests that there are gaps and future areas for deeper research. There were none that looked at um, photography, for example, and, and DRM, or video content, um, or interactive, interactive video games. So this is an example of how you could use the wiki um, you know, to investigate questions of interest to you and rather swiftly um, come up with an uh, overview of the current state of affairs. All right, I'm going to end there and pass on to Bartolomeo. So hi, hello everyone. Uh, so now I'd like to give you a quick uh, live demonstration of the visualization tool that both Martin and Chris uh, mentioned. So the, you know, what uh, Chris just demonstrated is the evidence wiki, so the data set uh, underlying the visualization tool. The visualization tool is built upon the wiki and is designed to help users detect uh, patterns, trends, and gaps across the over 850 studies uh, currently available on the wiki. 
So you can access it by clicking here on Evidence Viv. And as you can see, every time you open it, it takes some time to open, and that's because every time you open the visualization tool, it interrogates the data set, the wiki data set. So you know, if a new study is added to the wiki, it will automatically show on the visualization tool as well. Uh, as you can see, the visualization tool is organized in five main uh, tabs. Uh, the first one is the studies overview, which gives you a snapshot of the studies available on the wiki. So how many studies are currently catalogued, the jurisdictions they relate to here, uh, a timeline of publication, as well as the policy issues and uh, creative and cultural sectors that they relate to. So if you hover over you know, these letters, you can find out what those policy issues are, and the same with the industries. So say you're interested in exclusive rights, and more specifically in exclusive rights in the broadcasting industry, then you click here, and you immediately find that there are 11 studies currently cataloged on the wiki that address you know, that industry and that policy issue. And if you then scroll down, yeah, you can see when they're being published, but you also find the list of the results. You know, Put with the title of the paper, the authors, the various industries they relate to, and the policy issues they relate to, and then a link to the wiki entry and a link to the original source. Uh, if you then move to the next uh, tab, the by geolocation, uh, that's quite self-explanatory, so that's uh, the tab that allows you to browse the study by location or jurisdiction, and uh, so you can use either the list here uh, or the map, so say you're interested uh, you know, in studies about the UK, you click on the UK and you find our 111 studies uh, addressing the UK. And here on this uh, specific tab, you can't uh, match the search also with policy issue and industry, but you can do that manually by using the search box here. So again, say you're interested in you know, the broadcast industry in the UK, if you type broadcast there, then we'll filter it down to the six studies that are about the UK and specifically about the broadcasting industry. And uh, the, basically because that search functionality search is not only the title of the paper, but also the categories, the tags that are attached to that entry. So you will identify policy issues and industry as well. However, you know, for that kind of searches, I think the next uh, tab is probably the more effective one, which is the uh, industry and policy issue tab, which is basically a more granular version of the grid I showed you in the studies overview. So this one is quite interesting, as Martin showed you, you know, even you know, without clicking on anything, you can immediately find that you know, more than half of the studies uh, currently catalogued are about enforcement, and almost half of them are about the sound recording and music publishing industry. You can also get an overview of the methods, the pie charts that Chris uh, just showed you. But then say you're interested in a specific policy issue like exceptions, then you can click here and immediately find that there are 139 studies that uh, address ex exceptions as a policy issues. And you can see how both the list of industries changes, so the studies about exceptions relate mostly to the publishing industry rather than the sound recording one. And also the uh, methods by chart changes. Now qualitative methods are, you know, studies about exceptions tend to adopt qualitative methods rather than quantitative ones. So, what, so if you just click on, on those uh, uh, tabs, so what the visualization tool generates are all the wiki entries that include that tag. So all the wiki entries that are about exception, but say you're interested in very specific studies that only address exceptions as a policy issue, then you can do that by first ticking on the only direct matches on filter, and then on the, the issue you're interested in, and then you'll find a list of 40 studies that you know, only address exceptions as a policy issue, not exceptions as well as other uh, issues. Uh, finally, the last two tabs are the word cloud that gives you um, uh, an overview of the words that occur more often in the abstracts of the paper uh, cataloged. So unsurprisingly, copyright is the more uh, prominent one. Uh, but you know, say you are interested again in the exceptions paper, then if you click on there, you can see how you know, other uh, words like research, rights, you know, become more prominent. And the last tab is the uh, study network uh, tab. It gives, gives you a visualization of the studies that are most referenced by others, other studies within the wiki. Uh, and you can filter that uh, here at the top uh, by number of references. So if you only filter by one reference, it's a bit of a mess. But say you, know, you filter by five references, it becomes more manageable. Then if you hover over these circles, you can see 
you know, what those papers are, and then if you click on the circle, it will open the actual wiki entry. So that, that's the visualization tool in a nutshell. Uh, that was just to give you like a quick overview of its uh, functionality. And I believe you know, that uh, it's, uh, it can be a very powerful and effective tool, especially if used in combination with the wiki that uh, Chris just showed you to you know, carry out uh, uh, systematic studies like literature review quite quickly and effectively. So for example, that's what I did last year uh, when I produced a literature review of all the empirical studies on exceptions available on the wiki. So after playing a bit with the visualization tool, what I did was actually going through all of the 137 studies back then. We had two more since then, one by one. And, um, and the good thing is that on the wiki, you know, all the main information about a specific study is organized in a quite intuitive way. So you know, if you look at a single entry on the wiki, you will find the abstract describing the study, the main results of the study here, and then below the policy implications of that study. Uh, if there are any, as well as here on this column, like a description of the data that have been collected and used uh, in that specific study. So, you know, thanks to these two tools, the wiki and the visualization tool, I was able to quite uh, quickly and effectively carry out a review of all the studies uh, available on the wiki, and you can find it uh, here on the CREATE website. And just to conclude, I wanted to give you a few highlights of, of that review I did. Uh, so what I was able to find is that a common theme across all 137 studies about exception is an attempt to try and reduce the complexity of exceptions and so increase their pre uh, the predictability of their application. And those studies do that with a view to either helping courts interpret exceptions uh, consistently or to help uh, policymakers to draft exceptions efficiently or also to help users understand and therefore being able to rely on exceptions. And more specifically, it could also uh, group all those 137 studies into five main categories. There was like a, a bunch of studies about the judicial interpretation of exceptions. Uh, most of them were from the United States and focused on the interpretation of fair use, of the fair use doctrine. Uh, then there is a number of studies that evaluate policy options. So those are the majority of those are reports and studies commissioned by governments as part of lawmaking uh, processes. Then there is a vast body of literature that tries to evaluate and assess the impact of exception on specific creative and cultural communities like the glam sectors, galleries, libraries, archives, uh, and muse museums. And then there are a few studies that are about, uh, that address the public domain more broadly, so not specifically about exceptions, but about all the opportunities for lawful reuse without permission offered by copyright law. And many of those studies address the long standing question of whether innovation and creativity are better encouraged uh, by strong copyright or by a robust public domain or a combination of both. And then finally, there are a few studies that um, are about the relationship between technology and compensation, uh, the majority of which are about the private copying exception and whether that causes any harm to rights holders and whether that harm needs to be uh, compensated. So yeah, that was the uh, end of my bit. So I hope, uh, I would really encourage you to go to copyrightevidence.org and uh, play with it. You know, it can be a very powerful tool, you know, to conduct this kind of reviews uh, efficiently. So the so one question we always get is, is um, how did the studies get into the wiki? So how, how were they selected? Um, so we did, uh, up to 2016, we did uh, systematic literature reviews in the classic techniques, keyword searches on, on library databases. And then after that, we switched to a more inductive process um, by proposed studies and, and also keyword uh, searches, alerts um, via Google and Google Scholar. There, are about 100 studies still in the queue, which will be coded uh, in, in, at some point in May, June. And um, there's the, 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 the kind of change in, in 2016. We are not entirely sure you know, whether that really was peak copyright law. I mean, in some ways, it's possible. It's possible that you know, the, 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 the policy agenda and the interest of academics has moved on a bit from, from copyright law. I mean, there have been a second search probably linked to the d d Digital Single Market Directive in, in the European context, but it seems to be that there was a peak uh, a, 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 some, some years ago. But this is a, you know, still an open question, how exhaustive our database is. Um. So I'm going to now do a little bit of a deep dive into one of the industries that you could explore a little bit and talk about how you can use uh, the tool to kind of 
look a little bit further into new areas for research um, and what the studies tell us about where there are currently gaps in research. Um, so begin with some high-level data on studies that are actually in the platform and some of the clusters of research within them, but specific to the cultural institutions and other cultural activity sector. So for simplicity, I'm going to refer to it as GLAM, which is galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, but it is a little bit more broad than that. And then close out using some concrete examples of where we're seeing new research come through and emerging research gaps, which are really pushing the GLAM landscape in really exciting new directions. So to begin, you can just pop in in the ways that we've already shown you to browse the 59 studies on libraries, archives, museums, and other cultural activities using the evidence viz. Um, and you can see that there are some interesting peaks and valleys that correlate to more significant copyright reform in the timeline. Um, so just around 2014, where we saw some development of various orphan works measures and legislation, also right around 2019 with the bump in research related to the EU copyright directive um, on the digital single market and other national reforms. But another way to access these papers is just to go straight to the evidence um, wiki view and to click on the libraries, archives, museums, and other cultural activities list here which will take you to a list of all 59 studies that fall within this industry. And so you can browse by citation or kind of scroll through to get an overview of the topics covered by the papers. So the emerging themes from these studies in the platform so far relate to, in large majority, these kind of cluster of areas. Um, so we have empirical evidence about the cost of rights clearance, the process of getting permissions to digitize and perform other mission-based work. Um, copyright literacy, literacy among GLAM professionals, um, also among users in terms of exceptions, limitations, user rights and awareness. Um, but we also have a lot of evidence around risk aversion and self-censorship among GLAMs due to national or even cross-border fears of infringement and liability. And then with these last two, um, which I want to go into a little bit of a deeper dive on, um, we have exceptions for GLAMs related, of course, to orphan works, digitization, preservation, out of commerce, e-lending, and so on. Um, so really kind of a potpourri, thinking about the different exceptions, especially depending on archives versus museums, um, for example. And lastly, access to knowledge after copyright expires, and more specifically, how GLAMs are providing access to the public domain, how they're interpreting copyright during the reproduction of public domain works, regulating digital cultural heritage, and engaging with the open GLAM movement. So starting with exceptions, um, the wiki includes 137 empirical studies relating to exceptions broadly, published between 1982 and 2021, Within these, 27 relate to exceptions for GLAM institutions. And what emerges from them in the wider evidence um, is that cultural institutions really need robust exceptions to fulfill their public missions, and particularly so in the digital age. And these exceptions are now needing to really take account of the more complex realities that institutions are facing. Um, this is related to their own access to technology and legal expertise, um, the differences between non-commercial and commercial use, and even publication platforms, um, as well as cross-border access and engagement for their various audiences, and so on. And there's something to be said about you know, distinguishing exceptions and limitations for GLAMs from other sectors, particularly when their purpose is to support innovation, education, and public policy goals around copyright. Um, such as exceptions for cultural institutions to support the social, cultural, political, and economic, economic benefits that the copyright system itself is designed for. Um, but there's a fragmentation, of course, among what exceptions currently exist for GLAMs and even how such exceptions are defined or interpreted, um, such as exceptions to digitize for the preservation of cultural heritage, um, and so we currently have ongoing developments for preservation exceptions in, inter in international and regional law, um, especially those in the recent EU directive on copyright in the single market. And so these movements are kind of raising new questions around how they will be transposed at national level levels, as well as how they will be interpreted individually by institutions um, who seek to, to do things within the activities of those exceptions. Um, because they're not being interpreted in the same way, whether that's at national levels or even from one cultural institution to the next. So Bart goes into more detail about some of this in his contribution to the 21 for 2021 
on exceptions, um, but he also discusses the various papers and the platforms that overlap with different industries um, and issues in complementary ways, so I really recommend checking that out. Um, but what we're also seeing, and this is what I focus my contribution to the 21 for 2021 series, is that both the papers in the platform um, and evidence more widely is demonstrating that there's a wide range of new research emerging on and specifically because of the expiration of copyright. And so this is really important in the GLAM context because of cultural heritage institutions who steward billions of public domain works in the aggregate. And while it may seem that things become simpler for cultural institutions because copyright expires in those creative works, we're seeing repeat issues emerging in this area related to the cost required to conclude that copyright has expired and the works are in the public domain. The lack of consistency around interpretation of new copyrights and whether originality is satisfied during the reproduction of public domain works. The lack of consistency around copyright terms and the protection um, of institutions against their irrationality of digital legal borders and so on. So in short, the same fragmented legal landscape that's characterizing copyright is also characterizing the public domain. And it's not only increasingly burdensome for institutions, but it's also unrealistic to expect them to develop sophisticated interfaces for both in and out of copyright materials that rely on developed metadata and technology programs that limit access or geo-block materials. So this is where the exceptions research really comes into play in terms of how these issues complement each other. But at the same time, we have access to knowledge initiatives that are developing technological solutions to some of these questions, um, like the Triple IF framework um, that can help mitigate unlawful copying while delivering higher quality images for study and educational use. Um, so my own contribution to the series focuses on how some of these themes come out of the various papers and studies that are in the platform, but also how we can use those studies to identify gaps in research and support institutions in the interpretation of copyright um, and exceptions and the application of open access policies in light of the open glam movement. Um, because in theory, when copyright expires, things get more simple. Um, and that's then the question that arises when we think about the digitization and the reproduction of public domain works, and that being a, a copyright assessment that's entirely within an institution's control. Um, so developments like Article 14, which has just happened in the EU Directive on Copyright in the Digital Single Market, are really meant to deter the practice of claiming new rights, um, both copyright and related rights, and not original reproduction media produced around public domain works. And so these sorts of things, again, when we start to document them and, and put them into the platform, will really demonstrate some of this um, reform and legislative activity that's happening you know, at different moments in time. So the papers in the platform really present a trajectory of this area, starting with uh, early reproduction models and rights policies for digital images to the impact of new copyright claims um, on digitized public domain works, new business models that stem from open access to collections, um, and the application of public domain tools and licenses and so on. So just to give you three very quick examples about what this looks like in practice, we are now seeing that there's more than 1,600 GLAMs around the world that publish some or all of their digital collections to the public domain, amounting to more than 90 million digital assets being available to the public. Um, and the publications range in format, quality, and so on. Um, one example is the Museo Nacional de Historia Natural de Chile, which makes more than 200 3D models available on Sketchfab using the CC0 Universal Public Domain Dedication. Um, and so these publications are enabling all sorts of new access to knowledge opportunities and unfettered reuse of public domain materials, but they're also sparking new partnerships and opportunities with the public and creators. In India, the Heritage Lab, um, which is run by Madhavi Gandhi, collaborated with DAG Museums to publish a small set of images as CC by SA for users to reuse and create GIFs in a GIF it up competition. Um, so some of the winner submissions are shown here and all of them are licensed to CC by SA. And lastly, there's countless examples of new creations using public domain collections to create new artworks and cultural goods. Um, so Birmingham Museums has published its digital collection, CC0, which is immediately visible when you access the collection online. Um, and this sparked a collaboration with local artist Cold War Steve, 
who repurposed the paintings from the collection in his own photo montages. And then he published his original artworks as CC0 as well. Um, so the artist now has an online shop where you can purchase limited editions, puzzles, and other sorts of products. Um, and these are just a few examples of how new data on the public domain and the expiration of copyright is producing new data for the study of copyright, of reuse and dissemination in digital environments, and how important it is for GLAMS to have robust copyright exceptions and clear guidance on how to interpret copyright to protect the public domain so that they can fulfill the copyright's promise um, in, in the public interest. So expect to see more studies like this emerging and populating the platform as new data continues to emerge. So thank you so much for, um, for uh, joining us again. And um, we'd like to invite you to work with us. Um, it's great that we're, we've been able to um, you know, bring together such a diverse audience. We'd love to hear your ideas and thoughts about the wiki. We'd love to work with you um, to help make our resources more, more useful. Um, in the kind of work that you do. If you've got a study that's burning that you really would like to um, submit to the wiki, please do. Um, you can contact our um, managing editor, Amy Thomas, who's a lecturer in law at Glasgow on that email. And she sadly couldn't be here today, but she's been a pivotal person in, in developing the resource. Or you can email Professor Martin Kretschmer, director of CREATE, about how we might work strategically together. But now I'd, we'd like to turn it over to you um, and hear from you your ideas, thoughts, questions, um, anything really? Yes, sir. Yes. Well, thank you. Congratulations. It's a really useful tool. I, I was wondering if within the, the content that you have been collecting, are you including, uh, you know, papers or, or research related to how is the technical assistance that is leading to the current copyright laws? I, mean, I think that is an issue that is uh, very interesting for, for many policymakers is to know, you know how come the copyright law becomes that particular law and not other law. Well, what you see there is reflects what academics do. I'm not aware, but we could run a search, you know, I'm not aware that academic, academic studies in an empirical sense had actually tracked um, the issue, you know, whether technical assistance makes a difference and, and how it changes, you know, the, the, the implementation and, and adoption of, of laws. It, uh, I, I'm not aware that there's any systematic academic work on that, which you know is more than anecdotal. Is this um, your paper on the European Court of Justice? Uh, so the, the, there is a, a, I would say, a body of work which treats legal texts as empirical data. So that so it's mostly to do with with court decisions. Um, uh, there, there are some studies I, I was involved with uh, looking at the, the, the jurisprudence of, of the Court of Justice of the European Union, but in, in the U.S. there has been, you know, also content analysis of, of, of decisions, and, and some of these kind of content analysis techniques could be applied, you know, could be applied um, to, to, to offer some, some studies or to the questions you, you pose, but I'm not aware that, that there are any on... on conducted up to now, we could um, try technical assistance or something, <laughs> uh, whether it produce uh, any, um, any results. And if you know of some or you come across some studies like that, please, uh, please send them our way and we will include them. That would be the type of work which would be eligible for inclusion because it's about fundamentally copyright law, even if it's not you know, directly um, related. So I'm um, from Education International. Our public is, is mainly you know, uh, teacher organizations and also from researchers. But I have two questions. The first one is like if they're in the criteria you f where you filter some of the studies, are these only English uh, in origin? Are there many other languages considered? And my second question is, I don't see in the, there in the areas where you can filter the studies, if there's an, any, one, any of them related to education or teaching, because in the recent studies we, we've like worked on, uh, we're finding that you know, there are many challenges the teachers face, especially when dealing with copyright uh, yeah, uh, issues. I think um, Bartolomeo will be able to bring up some examples of education um, studies in the, in the wiki. Uh, but as for the question about language, thank you for that question. Um, currently, it's English only. 
um, but we are having discussions about how we can widen the intake of studies to include more geographical regions, more languages, um, to really be more of a global, a global um, resource. But unfortunately, for the moment, it is biased towards um, you know, Anglo-American European studies. It's in some ways defensible, um, you know, because English is the, the, the international language of science. So, 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 uh, so that there, there will, so there will be, uh, you know, some gaps. There will be some gaps, but you, you, you can make the assumption that if it's part of a, the international scientific debate, at some point the data will surface in English. I think that assumption we, we make implicitly. Um, you know, it may be one which we disagree with, but it, I think it's a fact of, of, of you know, scientific life. Um, uh, so there's the pragmatic answer and, and, the, and the, you know, uh, ideological answer, if you will. So, so, so ideologically, yeah, we, we would, would like to include, uh, you know, every empirical material that meets scientific standards in any language, and we shouldn't select that. <laughs> Um, but pragmatically, this is, you know, a big hurdle. It's a big hurdle because you need to have langu language, linguistic capability, and and if you assume that at some point it surfaces in English, um, then you can still assume that what you have here is, you know, is biased, but not completely. <laughs> you know, it's still it's still useful, um, even though we feel uncomfortable about it. So that's really probably what I'm trying to say. Um, and to answer your other question about education. So, uh, I mean, education is not one of the sectors uh, from the DCMS list that we used initially to create the wiki. I mean, there's one that is uh, called cultural education that uh, produces like 70 studies. I'm sure that's uh, what you're looking for. I mean, uh, one thing you can do on the wiki is to use the search box and just type education there or you know, other keywords, and that you know, you'll find that there are more than 500 studies that include education, either in the title or the abstract. Or you can also combine that with, you know, if you're interested say, in uh, exceptions for education, then you do, first you click on exceptions, so you filter it down by, uh, to the 139 studies on education, and then on the search box again, you type education, and you'll find 61 studies that are supposed to be about exceptions in education. And very briefly, I mean, uh, because in terms of like responding to the needs of teachers uh, about copyright law, maybe the, another resource I can uh, just show you very briefly that we just launched in beta version is uh, this one. Uh, it's called copyrightuser.eu, and it's supposed to make, it's intended to make EU copyright law accessible to everyone, including teachers, so to all copyright users or anyone who, you know, uses copyright as part of their job or creative activity, and teachers, of course, uh, are a part of that group. And so this is an initiative that also started in the UK, and recently we developed the EU version through the Recreating Europe Consortium on Horizon 2020 uh, project that is about to come to an end. And so, yeah, that's, uh, the website is already live in beta version, and, yeah, you can play with it, or I can show you more later if you're interested. Are there any other questions from the floor? Yeah, I, you have a listing of the documents. So, so but can I click and to see the the, the full document? Or? Yes, we've uh, we've got two links provided in each entry. One is to the publisher's website that holds the scholarly article, um, but another link should be an open access link, which will allow you to access the PDF of the full study. Yeah, but it's not for all studies for for copyright reasons. The, the more recent ones, you know, typically you have the full text. So thank you very much. <laughs>